the main issues that Ukraine is concerned about, uh, territorial integrity, mm, maintenance of its security and sovereignty, were simply not addressed by, in a public way at the conference. And the final document says nothing about them. This is an ominous sign, I think, for Ukraine. There's no, there's really no way that um, official um, Ukrainian government sources can spin this as a, a great a, a success, because so little was accomplished. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have again the pleasure of talking to Dr. Nikolai Petro, who is a professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island and has published the wonderful work, The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict. Uh, Dr. Petro is my go-to ex expert when it comes to all matters that political that are happening inside Ukraine. And because we've recently uh, seen a lot of developments, maybe not so much of internal politics, but of the way that Ukraine is interacting with uh, with other with other states. Uh, on the one hand, of course, the so-called Swiss Peace Summit that I want to talk about. And because um, Professor Petro has actually published a couple of new articles, I thought it's time for an update um, about the, well, the peace process or the lack thereof, um, if I'm if I'm honest, uh, Nikolai, thank you very much for joining me today. Nice to be with you again, um, Nic Nikolai. Maybe first of all, you, last week I believe or ten days ago, you published a new article with your colleague um, Ted Snyder uh, of the with the title "The West Should Be Receptive to Russia's Openness to Talks." And after you published that article uh, on Friday last week, uh, Vladimir Putin actually gave a big press conference. Actually, it was more of a conference in front of the of the foreign office. And he was talking about the well, uh, Russia's willingness to talk on the conditions ABC and Russia's willingness uh, to to contemplate what what Russia's goal would be for us for a a ceasefire and eventually a peace process. And then right after that, we've had the Swiss Peace Summit. Uh, could you maybe lay out what you wrote and how you interpret this last week, where actually a lot of actors were talking about peace without really going in that direction? Right. <clears throat> so I don't think he read my article. <laughs> Putin, I mean. <laughs> but um, I just picked up on things that have been mentioned by various Russian spokesmen for several weeks now, having to do with the fact that uh, Russia is uh, willing to negotiate. There is a framework for these negotiations, which got quite far. That is the Istanbul draft peace uh, agreement, the final negotiations of which, the final version of which was signed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation um, on uh, April 15th. And uh, the, the um, negotiations were still ongoing at that point. Uh, and uh, there had been uh reports news reports that russia would be interested in uh, going back to those agreements and revising them uh now to as russia puts it to reflect the realities on the ground now i think these statements and putin's speech, which was a very long speech, and I think a very important speech, to uh, the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs staff, uh, were indeed an attempt to insert the Russian agenda into the Swiss summit. I have a difficulty 
referring to the Swiss summit as a peace summit because there was no one there to negotiate with. The main interlocutor that they were presumably trying to address was not invited. So instead of calling it a peace summit, we should probably call it a rallying point or an attempt to uh, coordinate one side of the negotiations in preparation, as the final communique actually said, and I think the, the, the final communique of the Swiss su summit boiled down to the most important point, which is the statement that um, both sides, all sides in the process need to be invited and there needs to be a dialogue with all sides. And then the um, president of the Swiss Confederation asked about the ability of w whether it would be possible for Putin to come to Switzerland, given the ICJ order that he be arrested, said, well, we can make an exception in that case, <laughs> which I thought was very interesting an interesting statement about what we like to call in the west the the um rules-based order <laughs> well so. uh, the um, this one this this one is interesting anyhow but um i i share your your view that at best at best the swiss summit was a coordination point of a West the, of the Western coalition. The interesting thing, of course, is that they try to invite a lot of non-Western states, which kind of right. seems to point toward this having been more of a of a of a rallying a rallying call behind the flag, right? And but it didn't it didn't turn out to be that because the outcome document, as I said in a broadcast yesterday, is really really meager when it comes. Yeah. Actually, the the outcome document doesn't doesn't even. It's funny, it's always framed in Swiss media and, and, and in media general as a framework for peace. But this is probably one of the worst. No, this is not a clearly. Um, so let's be generous hmm. and say that Zelensky's 10 points, a uh, 10 point peace plan, which he enunciated many months ago, um, makes several points, some of them minor. Uh, but others more significant. And the basic, the, the ones that are most important, I think, for Ukraine are the withdrawal of Russian troops and the restoration of borders and remun what they call justice. In other words, remuneration for the damage done by the invasion. Those are probably the three most important of the 10. These were completely absent in the final communique. And Zelensky went into this Swiss summit with only three items that he was even uh, told, I guess, he could discuss, he could bring up. Uh, one was uh, the issue of nuclear energy. The um, <clears throat> second was the exchange of prisoners. And the third was the um, change of prisoners and civilians. Uh, and uh, the third was, well, I forget what the third one was, really. <laughs> A nu uh, nu nuclear power exchange of prisoners and right. um, the... Oh, ports, ports. The, 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 port the trade, is, yeah. The trade the black and ports, and, mm. right. Now, in the... The, and then there was the shell that contained these three subpoints, which was the negotiations and final agreement should be in the context of international law mm -hmm. and should reflect uh, commonly accepted principles. But it was the the way it was structured pretty much allowed any nation to sign on to those general statements, the general statements of 
do you support international law and the UN Charter? Yes, everybody's for that. Russia's for that. I mean, there, there's just no no debate on those. The debate comes on uh, the the practical issues, and on those three issues, uh, Ukraine got the the signature of. Uh, um, 78, 78 nations on the final communique and 15 couldn't even or didn't even agree to sign on to those that were present at the conference. And a number of key states uh, abstained from attending at all because they didn't even want to lend the initiative that much credence. So overall, uh, you know, uh, summits of this kind or, or meeting gatherings of this kind are organized in order to allow everybody to say they got something out of it. Yeah. So the supporters of Ukraine will say, well, look how many nations came and look how many of those uh, agreed to sign on. And uh, the skeptics would say, well, none of those players have any skin in the game, essentially, except the West. Their response was predictable. And the third world basically reaffirmed that it wanted a more inclusive and, and forced Ukraine to, to agree to terms in the final communique that there needed to be another summit and that that next summit had to include Russia. Um, what do you make out of Russia's silence on Monday? I have checked the Kremlin homepage, but I couldn't find any kind of communique or any kind of uh, reaction to what was published on Sunday evening. Um, you know, when when Vladimir Putin on Friday spoke and gave this this um, this talk to the uh, foreign ministry, uh, within an hour or so, I think I think, but the Americans rejected it, NATO rejected it, and on behalf of Ukraine, and then Ukraine yeah, also rejected yeah. it. Um, well, but now, also they did actually too. didn't. <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of I think it is very very meager in substance, but because it is so meager in substance, I think I mean a lot of these things is actually nothing that 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 the Kremlin is against. Prisoner of war exchange has happened before. Russia is all, is all for that. Um, right. Grain right. deal. We've had one between Russia and Ukraine, and we've had it, um, uh, so, nuclear yeah. safety. So everybody's for that, yeah. And uh, the grain deal, as we now know from Western reporting, was the, the Ukraine with, Ukraine withdrew from uh, the renewal of the accord, and we don't actually know why. What what the deal was there. So uh, again, there's, but, but those are, as I said, secondary issues. The main issues that Ukraine is concerned about, uh, territorial integrity, maintenance of its security and sovereignty were simply not addressed by, in a public way at the conference. And the final document says nothing about them. This is an ominous sign, I think, for Ukraine. There's no... There's really no way that um, official um, Ukrainian government sources can spin this as a, a great a, a success because so little was accomplished and so many key political players uh, either refused to participate at all or sent low level participants. So um, it's just another sign that the international community is no longer behind Ukraine with the same enthusiasm that it was a year and a half ago, for various reasons, probably, um, um, but the largest one being probably the sense that the outcome here Uh, is inevitable, the military outcome is inevitable, and it's not going to favor Ukraine. Now, we're probably, given that uh, military assistance has been approved for Ukraine, a new tranche of money, 
a new tranche of weapons, lots of talk about that. I think the West is going to go with one more roll of the dice in the hopes that there can be a breakthrough or there can be some sort of change in the pattern of uh, of the Russian attrition war that will that will change people's minds uh, about the inevitability of that kind of 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 confrontation between Ukraine and the uh, between Russia and the West in which Ukraine is of which Ukraine is the object. Um, if, however, that uh, doesn't happen and Russia essentially continues its slow advance, and I think the um, the outcome uh, uh, of the military conflict and whether the most recent uh, aid offered will change anything should be apparent by by the end of this summer or the fall. Well, then we'll have a very serious push to have uh, a subsequent peace negotiation involving Russia. And we know what the Russian position is because Putin has made it very clear now. And the most interesting thing about his most recent statements is not there's there's nothing really new about them, but he has simplified the process, right? So right now, from a from an outsider's perspective, or from the perspective of a of a third world or global South country that is not directly involved in the conflict, the perception is. Russia has said it wants to negotiate. Ukraine said it cannot negotiate. There's nothing to negotiate about until Russia completely withdraws. So it has refused negotiations. Ukraine has a peace program or peace uh, uh, peace peace platform, which is 10 points. Russia's peace platform is one point at this point. And uh, that one point is an official statement that Ukraine will not join NATO. And the second uh, thing is that what is what R Russia has is offering something right now that Ukraine is not offering, and that is an end to the bloodshed. Because they say, if Ukraine is willing to withdraw its forces, we will immediately declare a ceasefire. No territorial demands are on the table at this point, but simply all we need to do, says Russia, to uh, begin to go to have a ceasefire and the bloodshed and start negotiations is for Ukraine to withdraw its forces and to make an official statement that it will not join NATO. Yeah, and and here we probably need to explain that the, that the demand is that that Ukraine withdraw its forces from the parts of the four provinces right. of the four oblasts that are still for the right. battle. So uh, behind, uh, outside of the territorial borders of the administrative units, I don't know how many kilometers it is, but it's it's not very far uh, for Donbas and Lugansk. It's a little bit more uh, for uh, Kherson and Zaporozhye, I think. So in a sense, we are now at a point where Russia has clearly enunciated that its goal is that the the fighting ends along the lines of these four oblasts, right? The entire uh, right. administrations. And if we get to that point, if you take take, uh, take your, your troops back to that point, then we will not fire at you and we will actually uh, guarantee that you can retreat there. And and right. then and then we negotiate. And then we, and then we negotiate, to... right. Now, the, the positions of the negotiating positions are clear. But we should not make too much of that as an obstacle because everyone goes into yeah. any negotiation with maximalist demands. And those are what the negotiation is supposed to settle, what the accommodation is, what is the compromise to be made between these demands. 
but no one goes into a negotiation giving away their hands. So it's perfectly normal to, for each side to say, to, to make its most extreme demands before the negotiations. And then the negotiations are conducted behind closed doors so that some accommodation can be reached outside of the glare of public attention and then presented to the public. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in a sense, we are now at a point where we actually from both sides have the maximalist demands. We have of, from the international community a couple of couple of ideas. And I would like to also include that the Russian uh, the Russian peace plan that they floated about one and a half years ago um, mm -hmm. actually contained uh, the these the three points that were made and and also part of the of the things around it. I think one of the uh, very good commentators on Twitter, uh, Arnaud Bertrand, he he pointed that out that uh, uh, six out of the twelve points of China's peace plan are yeah. actually inside the current one. So we are seeing kind of a yeah. at least there's there's something emerging at the moment. Uh, right, question but... is, will Go it on. transform into a peace process or not? Again, I would divide what I call the peace into two stages. One is the allowing the negotiations to commence, sitting down at the table. And the second is the negotiation itself leading to finally a peace accord. On paper, everyone says, that they want all three. They want negotiations in order to have um, a process of dialogue in order to reach a stable peace. But they're not, so in the West and in Ukraine, there is a great reluctance to begin the process. The, the impediment is at the stage of saying, Yes, we're willing to sit down and negotiate. Because it's, that would mean that that, you, that you're admitting that your maximalist demands are probably out of the window. That's what the beginning... Well, to the extent that any negotiation uh, moves away from the original position, yes, that's true. But that should that is never normally seen as an impediment to the process of sitting down maybe instead of negotiations we should say sitting down at a table it, it we should remember how many months it took for the vietnam the north vietnamese leadership and the united states government to sit down because the obstacle was should it be a round table at that they're sitting at or a square table <laughs> and they couldn't get over that. <laughs> so there's all sorts of pretexts and excuses made that eventually just are swept away by the need to reach uh, a, the stage of actual discussion of substantive matters. And the good thing for both Ukraine and Russia, I don't know if it's good for the West, They've rejected it out of hand in the past and keep rejecting it. But the good thing for Ukraine and Russia is there is already an agreement that was signed, that was that was placed, discussed, and initialed in 90% of its substance. So what is left to actually negotiate, and I'm not saying it's easy to negotiate the most difficult points, but the actual points of negotiation, after we move beyond what is already in principle agreed to between Russia and Ukraine. And these are important points like neutrality that has actually been accepted by both sides. Um, the issue of uh, NATO membership was also in principle agreed, agreed to by both sides, that, that Ukraine would, in exchange for not seeking NATO membership, Russia said, you would have, they were offering to Ukraine NATO-like guarantees by members of the, of the UN Security Council. Yeah. And then it was a matter of discussing uh, which members of the Security Council and other states would 
form uh, would would be the participants in these guarantees and the nature of their engagement in defense of Ukraine if it were attacked. But those are fairly technical issues. And one of the reasons, by the way, that I see Ukraine's process of signing bilateral agreements with everybody under the sun now, especially in, in Europe and the United States recently, I see it as a good sign because it, in fact, through the back door, fulfills that commitment. Because the reason that, um, uh, one of the reasons that the Istanbul Accords fell through was that the United States was at that point in April of 2022, not willing to commit any serious resources or its own uh, troops as, a, as an obligation to the defense of Ukraine. Now, it seems that's at least a possibility in some context. And uh, certainly they are, the United States and other countries have been willing to make, uh, to sign long-term support agreements. Although the nature of that support, of course, is very unclear. Yeah, and we are now in this interesting situation where we have what you talked about, this Istanbul agreements that are that we know that uh, the Russians and Vladimir Putin has been has been saying for two years, guys, this would be an actual framework. And he actually never published it. I wondered why, because it would be such an easy win. But obviously, he didn't want to, want to endanger the possibility of this to come to become again a, a, a basis for. Uh, an actual an actual way towards um, ending ending the hostilities and we now have the the New York Times which a few days ago published uh, one or that agreement uh, in one, its agree one version of the agreement, one, yeah. one version because there were many versions out there yeah, um, yeah. and you also noticed that uh, for the first time in two years uh, one of your articles was actually published in Ukraine in Ukrainian right yes uh, I thought that this... was very interesting. Can, yeah, can you talk about that? So the article that I wrote for The Conversation, which has been reprinted in a number of American newspapers and, and some European websites, um, discusses the problems that Ukraine is having with its mobilization efforts. Um, the numbers of troops that they are likely to add to the active roles of the Ukrainian army is much less than the numbers that the general staff has been talking about in the past. So Valery Zaluzhny, the former commander-in-chief, uh, spoke of 450,000 to 500,000 additional troops needed but the numbers from the general staff now about, or I should say, regarding uh, the new troops that could possibly be added as a result of this mobilization uh, are probably, they say, no more than 100,000. And as a result, uh, the basic problem remains, which is that Ukraine does not have the resources to fight a war against Russia and win. It doesn't have the economic capacity. It doesn't have the weaponry. It doesn't have the training. And it doesn't have the troops. Just in basic numbers uh, and resources. So that is why Emmanuel Macron and Baltic, certain Baltic officials and uh, other heads of state in Eastern Europe have floated the idea of NATO troops basically going in, replacing the Ukrainian troops that are not there and cannot cannot be engaged, cannot be found, because they don't exist. And the dangers, that, that poses a, a danger of escalation, as people have said. But unless, I argued, the 
unless this understanding of the basic problem of Ukraine comes to Western leaders, then there is in fact no alternative left to Western strategy but to send NATO troops. And that should be clearly stated. In other words, it doesn't matter what, Bo what Biden says right now or the head of NATO says right now, because the military staff is pointing out that you cannot win without, or you cannot probably even hold the line, is more likely, without these NATO troops. And the fact that the politicians don't admit it means very little to the military staff because they have to make these plans. And I quoted the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States who said that some form of U.S. troop involvement, probably in the capacity of training, but nevertheless, troops are troops, he said is inevitable. It is inevitable. It will occur. So you see there's a discrepancy here that your typical Western reader is not told about because he thinks the politicians are in charge, but the politicians eventually bow down to the military logic in a military endeavor. So in order to get out of this dead end, you have to transform what is currently a military endeavor in Ukraine to defeat Russia into a political effort, into a negotiated scenario. And that hasn't hurt. That hasn't occurred yet. Yeah, yeah, but that's those those are the two routes. Either you do it military, sure, yeah. militarily or you do it diplomatically. And in a sense, that the, the question now is, are we gonna go and you know do the reverse of Clausewitz and con continue the war by other means, which is at the at, at the negotiating table? The the question now for me is, does this indicate to you that there is an actual change inside the the Ukraine and the top levels of Western decision making. Um, because, I mean, it seems to me that still the biggest stumbling blocks toward moving to a real negotiation is Washington and on a lower level than also Kiev. But in Kiev now, Vladimir Putin also said there, there are still people who can negotiate with us uh, constitutionally. And what he means is that Mr. Zelensky's term has, of course, run out. Right. Which doesn't mean that he he didn't he didn't say it uh, in in that speech. But um, do you think that Russia is gambling on a couple of 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 internal Ukrainian um, stakeholders, political stakeholders, who might be able to you know carry the process forward and maybe even do so with the with the okay from from Washington? Possibly, but. I don't believe one, it, it would be a fool's bet. You should never, ba I, no, no power would base its a policy on the expectation of a, of a coup or some radical shift uh, by people that you don't know and whose ambitions and possibilities and capacities you have no way to gauge or to control. And that 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 is the case for any opposition figures in Ukraine today. Not but not necessarily a coup, but what about the Ukrainian uh, parliament? If 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 there was a majority in parliament to actually, you know, propose a bill that negotiations should start now, um, wouldn't that wouldn't that force the hand of, of the government? There is no such uh, majority because the Parliamentary elections have been frozen as well. And they have been frozen in the condition that the president's party, which, by the way, there have been rumblings in Ukrainian politics about how cavalier the presidential administration has been toward the Ukrainian parliament, taking it for granted. But there is no political figure in the parliament that has the stature to argue on behalf of the nation. And it would be hard to imagine, I mean, you could fantasize and come up with scenarios, but there's no obvious way from the present to an alternative to Zelensky. So de facto, what is probably 
more likely if negotiations are to start is that Zelensky would have to still be the figurehead but forced to forced into negotiations by other influential political actors both in Ukraine and in the West simultaneously and that that combination where he is still the one sort of presenting the face of Ukraine, but nevertheless somehow transforming himself from a, the leader of a besieged nation into a leader who can lead the nation to peace. A, a different capacity now, a, a, a different type of statesmanship. If that's in his repertoire, that would be how he would have to go. Sometimes I, I, I watch him, I, I see his Zelensky's speeches, the way he phrases certain options, and I think he may understand this, he may, that he needs to be flexible and he needs to uh, be careful in his choice of words and leave options open. But then um, he never takes it any further and his uh, spokesman, be it his chief of staff or um, military advisors, pull back on any such suggestions and take, take a very hard line against any negotiations in principle, which of course restricts him. Now, there has been uh, speculation that the spate of firings of Western supported officials in the Ukrainian government, most recently Mustafa Nayem, but there's been like five or six before him um, that were known to be the favorites of the United States and uh, the, the G7 embassies in Kiev, um, that, that, that their removal is so, perhaps a signal that Zelensky wants to be more independent in his choices and that he's not going to do everything that is asked of him and that he's a lot he's less worried now than he was before about being called you know not serious about fighting corruption and you know not being serious about reform because really what do those matter to him he's fighting for his for his own and for his country's political survival and um and that maybe you know should be logically his first goal and that in order to do that as I've argued in the past, he does need to distance himself from the straitjacket that is imposed on his negotiations with Russia by the West. But uh, so far, nothing significant has come to light in terms of openings or dialogue with Russia. But of course, if there was a dialogue on a military level or on some other level, between Ukrainian officials and Russian officials, why would they tell us about it? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I, I just, I just keep wondering. You know, um, there's this big debate on how in how free Ukraine actually is to take its own decisions and how much tethered it is to the to the decisions that are made in Washington and Brussels by NATO and and the US, right? And I think there's no definite way of answering that. But are there any indications? about at least public opinion in Ukraine, you know, and especially of the Galician part, right, of, of, of Western Ukraine, are opinions shifting on, on uh, you know, uh, like convert, accepting realities and just right. saying that better mm -hmm. we get to a ceasefire than we hold on to a part of the country that whose citizens we didn't like at the beginning very much anyhow. Um, is there a change? Well, um so there are inconsistencies in the desires 
of Ukrainians who have been surveyed, and they are regularly surveyed um, on their attitudes and on their support for government, various government ministers, various branches of government. Are they, would they be willing to negotiate uh, with Russia under what conditions, what would they see as the desired results? We have seen in the last six months a perceptible decline in public support for Zelensky. The latest figures that I saw today speak of a 20% decline, but still over 50%, close to 60% say that they have confidence in Zelensky. And uh, the majority still of Ukrainians feel that uh, the country should fight on. Because, uh, well, who knows why, but I suspect because they feel that it may still be possible to either, uh, to, to achieve better results. Uh, for Ukraine than the current status quo. Uh, so um, I think there will always be some portion of the population that feels that way, even to the very end. Mm. I was reading recently, now not opinion surveys, of course, but a newspaper, Polish newspaper accounts of the six weeks uh, Blitzkrieg that Nazi Germany undertook in 1939 when invading Poland. And uh, I was struck by the fact that on every day until the final capitulation, newspapers reported that Polish forces were winning <laughs> and about to throw back the German invaders. Yeah, uh, we see that consistently. We we see that in every war. It's it's part of the way modern warfare is conducted. It's it's conducted in order to build public support because public support is vital for the war effort for people to go to war, for people to uh, go to build up the economy, to provide for war. This is all all very important. And you certainly wouldn't want to, to undermine your own population's belief in your ability to succeed in the war, because then it would be immoral to continue uh, the, this struggle. Mm, so we have that uh, situation in Ukraine. Uh, the uh, public support is slowly eroding, but it will never collapse <laughs> significantly. I think at the very lowest, it will probably be, be fall below 50%. But that would be already dramatic. You you were the one who pointed out, I think <clears throat> in your book, but also before in, in, in many articles, the disproportionate amount of influence that the ultra-right wing has on Ukrainian policy making, although they only poll in very, very low numbers and have very low support, uh, they because they're they're willing to be so violent, they have disproportionate uh, uh, influence on the on the political process. And you, uh, a couple of months ago, you told me that the big change inside Ukraine might come in at the moment when those ultra nationalists decide that it's better to to negotiate than to lose everything. Uh, is that still right. something that's going through your mind or not? Well, you have to understand that um, the right wing of the political spectrum is just like the center and the left. It is fragmented and there are individual leaders and individual leaders and groups have sometimes uh, contradictory ambitions. So just to, to stick with the far right, you have to on the one hand, argue to the larger population that you are more radical and more committed 
to your ideals than your rival leaders in the far right. So you have to be ultra right compared to your to 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 others uh, who are competing with you for political influence in that in that political uh, segment of the population. But once you achieve a certain prominence as a spokesman for for that ideology, for that section of the of the populace, you do have to say, well, if if the effort that I am engaged in is leading to the collapse of the country, to the destruction of the country, or to its loss of significant resources, then I have to step back and be willing to negotiate in order to save and fight for another day. And um, there is there is a, a stage at which for a, a successful politician, for, for any, any politician that is worth his salt, uh, is willing to give up fanaticism in exchange for success. If not, then they just, you know, yell forward unto the death and they die. That's it. They're over. <laughs> and their political influence is over. So if you want your political influence and your political ideals to survive, you have to be willing to give the semblance of compromise. And we see that in a lot of successful revolutionary movements, that they actually come to power and stay in power, not because they are committed to what they said they would achieve, but because they actually compromised and then promised their own followers that they would continue in this way in the future. Meanwhile, for the next 10, 20 years, it's all about political compromise. Yeah, at the, at the moment, that's called pulling a Maloney. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, sorry, I mean, like, uh, yeah. Miss Maloney, she came yeah. to power with a quite radical uh, base, and now she's f a fa a fairly integrated into the, um, yeah. the global Yeah, but I was agenda. also thinking of, for example, the interesting example of Nelson Mandela, Mm. and the African National Con uh, Congress, because Nelson Mandela's most influential uh, ally politically and most, uh, uh, let's say, combatant, mil most militant, was the, was the South African Communist Party. And once he came into power, he never condemned them, but he clearly distanced himself from them because he was now acting as a unifying force in South Africa, and at the same time, appealing to the former devils, appealing to the West for political support. So he had to really reinvent himself in that way. And uh, ultimately, even the South African Communist Party became much less radical as a result, because it too wanted to hang to hang on to Nelson Mandela's what they had. Skills. Yeah, yeah. And I May could easily see a very similar development among the the numerous small fringe groups in the far right in Ukraine. Very last question. Um, are, is there anything that, that you're going to have particularly an eye on over the next couple of weeks in, in order to understand what's, what's happening uh, in between Russia, Ukraine and the West? Anything that's on the horizon that you think is going to be quite important uh, coming up next? Maybe the NATO, NATO summit in July in Washington or what, what are you going to look at? I don't see anything new coming out of the West because the rhetoric seems to have uh, hemmed in original thinking on negotiation. The, 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 the rhetoric is so extreme that it has become mainstream in the West. So what I think we're going to see instead is uh, peace initiatives taking off of the, uh, of the Swiss summit organized by the um, United Arab Emirates, or maybe China, or maybe some third parties. Saudi uh, Arabia. Yeah. In, uh, again, 
not mimicking the Swiss process, but putting Russia center stage and inviting Ukraine. Now, if that were the case, what will Ukraine do? It would be a very bad look to reject participation on that basis, just because Russia was there. Who knows? But even the Swiss, again, the final Swiss communique is, leaves Ukraine with no options for, fut for the future, but negotiations with Russia. And I would say that's that the true. single most important thing that has come out of the Swiss summit, that the future will have to be some sort of multilateral, certainly, but essentially vis-a-vis uh, -vis negotiations between Ukrainian officials and Russian officials. That is true. And Ukraine signed that document or, or publicly committed to it. So yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. OK, uh, Nikolai Petro, thank you very much for your time. This was a very enlightening talk uh, and we'll speak again. Thank you.